Um, so I'm just going to go through an introduction of the panelists who very kindly agreed to come and, and speak with us today. Uh, and then we'll turn the projector off so that they can now uh, we can scooch back together again. Just to introduce myself, my name is Jacqueline Furness, and uh, I founded a company uh, called uh, Vida Hall, and uh, and we are a fine art printing and mounting and fabrication company, uh, things to, all things to do with photography, and uh, our focus at Vida Hall is is really to be collaborative with artists and help them to achieve the highest possible standard when it comes to their prints or the display of their work. Um, and so uh, we like to take our direction from them and help make their vision come true in a way that will be as archival as, as possible um, within their artistic parameters. I've, I've done these in alphabetical order, so I thought that would be the most egalitarian way of doing that. Um, so. Uh, here's, we have Mandy Barker, who is one of the Wing Masters Award finalists for this year. Uh, Mandy received uh, her Masters in Photography from De Montfort University. Her artistic direction has evolved from graphic design to contemporary work. She's exhibited worldwide, including the Photographer's Gallery. Um, is it Dimar? Dimar Noble? Uh, Dimar Noble. Dimar Noble the Mall and Cork Street Galleries, Science and Technology Park in Hong Kong, among others. Her current work, Soup, has achieved international attention, as you can imagine, dealing with this issue of waste, um, including an exhibition at the Aperture Gallery in New York for her first runner-up in ph Photography Book Now in 2011. She's been published in Time, National Geographic, Financial Times, and the Explorer's Journal for her journey from Tokyo to Hawaii. Um, and you're seeing some photographs here, which uh, Mandy might reference uh, later, uh, where she, uh, these are examples from a manta trawl that they did on the ship and some several sieves taken out of the ocean. So thank you, Mandy, for being with us today. Thank you. Um, Next, we have the lovely Mimi Chun. Thanks, Mimi, for coming. Mimi is the founder and director of Blind Spot Gallery here in Hong Kong, set up in 2010 to bring contemporary photography, an art form that was in the blind spot of the Hong Kong art scene, true, very true, uh, to a higher degree of visibility. Blind Spot Gallery features both emerging and established artists, mainly from the region and also from beyond. Mimi is born in the United States and raised here in Hong Kong. She holds a degree in film from the School of Communication at Hong Kong Baptist University and a postgraduate diploma in photography from London College of Communication in the United Kingdom. And uh, you know, Mimi's gallery has really done quite a lot um, to bring photography and uh, the contemporary art of photography to the forefront in Hong Kong. So thanks so much for being with us, Mimi. Thank you. Kyle Ford, who's, who's sitting over here, you'll, you'll get to see more of him, I'll use the pointer later. <laughs> uh, Kyle Ford is an internationally published and exhibited artist and educator based in Hong Kong. He's also an accomplished printer with his expertise specifically in fine art inkjet printing. Kyle's work navigates ideas of perception, representation, and interaction surrounding the natural world. His photographs have been featured in magazines, galleries, and museums all over the globe, uh, including Popular Photography, Newsweek, and the RISD, he's been at the RISD Museum of Art, Connor Contemporary in DC, Daniel Coney in F Fine Art in New York City, and the Museum of Fine Arts at FSU. Um, <coughs> He received his MFA from the Savannah College of Art and Design, where he also actually uh, worked in their Hong Kong campus. Uh, and he's also been the printer for Steve McCurry, including having printed the famous Afghan girl. <laughs> um, and here's a great wor uh, work by Kyle of, um, of his series that has to do with um, our interaction and perception of the natural world. It's a great, great series of work. Thank you, Kyle, for being with us. Thank you. And Douglas So, Douglas So uh, is, is quite a pioneer. He is um, 
a solicitor of Hong Kong, but also he is the founder of F11 Photographic Museum, which is housed in a beautiful heritage building in Happy Valley. Uh, the museum opened in September 2014. Currently, Douglas is vice president and pro-vice chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. Douglas is someone who's very keen to serve the community. He's the secretary and a council member of UNICEF Hong Kong, a board member of the Hong Kong Cyberport Management and the Hong Kong Community Chest. He's a trustee of the Hong Kong Philharmonic, a member of the Hospital Governing Committee of the Duchess of Kent Children's Hospital, a member of the History Museum Advisory Panel, amongst others. After leaving the Hong Kong Jockey Club in September 2014, he founded F11 Photographic Museum to promote photography and heritage conservation here in Hong Kong. And um, they are very dedicated to giving uh, tours, curated tours and led tours to groups, including many student groups uh, throughout Hong Kong. And it's a wonderful endeavor. Thanks so much, Douglas, for being here. Thank you. And. Last but certainly not least, we have Kurt Tong, who was a uh, Wing Masters Award finalist in 2014. And I mentioned that you know Mandy and Kurt both, uh, because Weeder Hall sponsors the printing and mounting, are two, pe two artists who really focus on what happens uh, with their images. And they struck me as people who um, we learned firsthand working together are very involved in the post-production of what happens with their work. And so I thought they'd be very instructive. Uh, and if you didn't have a chance to see Kurt's work, uh, it's available to see online. But it's very, very special in person. Uh, Kurt's born in Hong Kong in 1977 and originally trained as a health visitor at the University of Liverpool. He's worked and traveled extensively across Europe, the Americas, and Asia. In 1999, Kurt co-founded Prima Vassam, a charitable home for disabled and disadvantaged children in Chennai, South India. Kurt became a full-time photographer in 2003 and was the winner of the Louis Valtuina, Valtuna, Valtuina. Inter sorry, my, it's terrible. I can't pronounce it. International Humanitarian Photography Award with his first picture story documenting the treatment of disabled children in India. Kurt gained his master's in documentary photography at the London College of Communications in 2006 and began wor working on his personal projects. Wait. This is a photograph of his work from last year's show. It's very difficult to see how he's actually done a lot of hand treatment to the images after they were printed. Much of Kurt's recent work, while remaining photographic in essence, has moved towards installation and sculptural, ba and sculptural based practice, pushing the boundaries of the medium. Kurt's been recognized by several photographic, cultural, and humanitarian organizations for his work and is represented by Jen Beekman Gallery in New York, the Photographer's Gallery in London, and by Identity Art Gallery and Blind Spot Gallery here in Hong Kong. Thanks, Kurt, for being here. So, I think what we should do at this point is possibly turn the projector off so that the panelists can sort of swing forward. And I, I wanted to open up by asking uh, <coughs> the artists, and, and that is, includes uh, Mandy, you know, Kurt, and as, as well Kyle, how involved you get in the exhibition of your, of your pieces? How hands-on are you in the display and the lighting, and maybe I, I don't know to what degree you like to sort of interject to the artists and how much you have to kind of get involved, but perhaps we could start there. Um, well, I think it really depends on whether it's a group show or a solo show. Um, certainly if it's a solo show, then I get totally involved in um, the print, obviously, always. Um, the framing, lighting, uh, liaising with the curator, um, right across the board. If it happens to be a group show, um, then sometimes the curator has um, already preconceived ideas of how they want the work mounting and maybe they want it to sit with other work in a specific way. So it really does depend on um, what type of show for me. Yeah, I totally agree with Mandy. Uh, it usually depends on the nature of the show, whether it's a solo or a group. Um, but I always try to 
I get very, very hands-on in all areas uh, of installing a show from um, actually nailing them on the wall to uh, adjusting the lighting, everything, because I find it very difficult to explain how you want to position a work on a wall um, to someone else. So I, I always, I try to make sure I'm there when doing the installation of the work. And uh, it is also very important to work with the artists and try to fulfill how they think their work should be positioned and installed. Um, yeah. Mandy, are you often installing work for artists who aren't present? Maybe they're overseas or you must do the installation before they've arrived? Oh, we normally come up with, uh, in that case, I try to get artists um, um, to Hong Kong uh, at least a, a few days in, before the opening of the show. Um, if that's not possible due to their schedule or whatever, I, we, we, we have a plan um, decided together. We have a plan normally weeks before um, the installation of the exhibition. Kerr, you're quite a particular person when it comes to your work. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I, I agree with Mandy about kind of group shows and solo shows. Um, I take over with the, well, I usually work with a curator. Um, <laughs> yeah, between me and the curator, we take over the space. Um, and especially with my new work, it's very much kind of installation and site specific. So okay. it, yeah, it, it, I take over the place space. But in terms of group shows, yeah, um, I've been kind of, because of where my work's going, it doesn't really fit in with group shows anymore. Right. <laughs> so unless it's a really good venue, I tend to turn down group shows now. Right. Because um, I don't get to be in charge. So. And Douglas, you're working, Douglas, you're working quite often with um, artists who are sometimes posthumously being being shown in in your gallery in your museum, as well as with artists who are flying in and may not have been able to be there. How do you handle that? I just re want to respond to your earlier question. I think um, in terms of um, you know uh, organizing exhibitions, I, I think careful and detailed planning uh, is everything. And now they, thanks to you know technology, of course, you know I I, I totally agree with Mimi that uh, it's important that you know you maintain a very constant dialogue you know with the photographer, um, you know to make sure that in curating the show. Um, um, the story or you know the photographer's you know wishes and and you know what he would like to do in the exhibition actually get uh, exhibited and is shown uh, you know to your visitors but at the same time thanks to technology now um, like you know for example um, uh, nowadays I know that there are technologies which make available for example the 3d you know rendition uh, uh, of a particular venue that you can actually plug in uh, images in, into 3D um, uh, 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 pictures or even uh, like a video clip that you know you can put everything together and send it to the photographer you know who may be overseas for approval so this is you know how you know, we have done it in the last uh, few times you know with with our exhibitions and we found it very very um, you know effective because uh, um, then uh, before the uh, photographer arrives uh, or even in the process the photographer will be able to give you very valuable input and at the same time you know when he or she arrives uh, basically uh, before he steps into the door he knows what to expect so uh, basically, in the end, it's a matter of when uh, when the artist arrived, uh, whether or not you know he thinks everything is done you know uh, to his standard. I, I think you know I just want to mention the technology part, yeah. and uh, and we should make good use of it. Yeah, Kyle. I mean, you have galleries that you're working with, and you're in an entirely other part of the world. So, how uh, how important is that relationship uh, with the gallery? and someone who's going to be showing your work. Well, I think it's important that, um, that I agree with nearly what everything has been said already. Um, it's important that you're understanding all the technical aspects of what's going into the print, and um, you could even get, I guess, as anal, and I'm quite anal in my own artistic practice. I like to take control just like Kurt. I like to have full and utter understanding of how the representation of my work is going to come through but I think it's even down to the point of like the color temperature of the lights that they're going to be using within the gallery setting um, the prints will be made specific to those color temperatures of lights so that it's represented in the correct form or um, in the artifact that it should be so that it's presented in that way so it, it the relationships that you build with the galleries or the gallerists or the curators or the museums that you're working with it's important that they are um, 
as understanding of your own ideas, but that they are also articulate of what they want to get out of the representation of the work too. And it's kind of this back and forth yeah. agreement. It's, it's nice to have um, that kind of communication. Sometimes you don't have that full communication and maybe there's a frustration there or maybe there'll be uh, different exhibitions that you'll work with where the space is, is limited and you have to make sacrifices as an artist and, and those are the ones we want to try to avoid and I think that's exactly what Kurt's speaking to the point where like, I don't want to be group exhibitions anymore because my work is going to be sacrificed in a way, the quality of it, sure. There's a, there's a few seats up here. If, uh, if anyone's in the back, please, please come, come and sit down. Um, you know, it, it clearly sounds like no one, and I mean, it's been designed that way, no one up here just leaves anything to chance, which is fantastic. But I'm, I'm quite interested, you know, Mimi, for example, you show work that often might seem on the face of it to have perhaps no commercial uh, value whatsoever to the general public, which I think is wonderful because you are in business, you're a gallery, you have rent and bills to pay. How do you balance that and, and do you find that you rely heavily on placing work in institutions or, you know, how does Blind Spot manage that, that process, that balance? We, we do show works that are not for sale um, sometimes either because the works are sold out or the artists don't want to sell them. Um, we make the decision to, to show this work, to include this works in a show normally because it provides a reference point to the, art, to the audience's understanding of the artist's work or it enhances the academic value of the exhibition. For example, um, we did a uh, a big group show with 12 artists from uh, from China uh, featuring the avant-garde Chinese photography from 1980s to uh, 1990s. And we had to borrow lots of old works from Chu Chu Jie and Ai Weiwei because, simply because we can't work around a theme without showing these artists' um, works. Um, or, for example, uh, last year we, we featured um, Martin Paul's recent project about Hong Kong. We uh, deliberately put in some iconic works from the 1980s and 1990s to provide a reference point to the audience. Not everyone in Hong Kong know who Martin Paul is. So, I mean, in essence, you're taking on somewhat of a contemporary museum role in some ways by curating the space, not fully for commercial value. I mean, that's quite a dedication to the medium, I'd say, because um, that kind of context comes at a very high price point. Yeah, you're right. I would like to believe our shows are, are commercial, yet uh, academic and conceptual. And I think is um, our, our gallery space is quite big, so each show is a large-scale exhibition. I would like to think our show also provide an opportunity for um, not educating, but providing a chance for the public to learn more about um, photography or some particular artist's works. It also helps by enhancing the academic value of a show. It also helps placing the exhibition or any individual works in institution and um, private collections. Douglas, as, as someone who's, who's um, operating as a museum, therefore, you know, not selling, selling work. To what degree is the work that you sell and the reference material um, under your ownership or are you part of a um, loan scheme with other institutions or is it that uh, with the artist or their estate? How, how are you able to kind of gather all the materials that, that you, cause you, you, the curation is wonderful. Um, when I've been to... Thank you. To uh, I think there are different ways to do it because we are a not-for-profit museum. Uh, basically, we are now currently showing works, you know, from the archive of F11. Uh, so, uh, apart from exhibitions, uh, we do different activities. You know, we, we have some educational activities, uh, we have guided tours, we have, uh, uh, at the same time, we have a lot of research going on uh, because, you know, for our exhibition, actually research is a very, very important part of it. And we hope that for every exhibition, we would have some kind of publication uh, which will come out with it. So, uh, so um, you know, this is our aim, and then we have got uh, people from academia helping us, uh, and also uh, people who might have worked in the museums. You know, they are very
very, very keen in doing research, and uh, the quality of their research is, is really outstanding. So I think we, we approach uh, exhibitions, you know, from a different angle. I mean, it's only one of the activities that is going on at the F11. I think in terms of you know getting the works, there are also other ways to do it. For example, right now we're showing Robert Kappa, 1938. I mean that. The 50 images took us about five years to put together, okay? Um, but at the same time, there are works that we would like to show. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, Joseph Kudelka. I mean, he's very famous you know, for his images of Czechoslovakia and other things. But he has stopped make, making prints you know, many, many years ago, and he's only got a few um, sets of his collections going, going around. So for this type of works, basically it's impossible for you to buy. Um, uh, well, maybe some some collectors will be willing to 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 um, to part with their you know very precious collection of uh, Joseph Kudelka's images, but chances are very unlikely. So for those uh, uh, exhibitions, if F11 is going to do it, then we might have to you know enter another type of loan. Um, yeah. arrangements with them uh, to ensure that you don't, we can bring them here. But I noticed that you know, a lot of these institutions, for example, ICP, you know, they, they are very, very uh, interested, for example, in Asia, but at the same time, they want to know the positioning of your museum. I mean, what you want to do and what the, the show would be like and what will you be adding you know, to the works in terms of scholarship, in terms of research, in terms of, you know, promoting, for example, Kappa uh, in Asia. So um, it's, it's not just about, you know, showing the works. I mean, there are a lot of other considerations behind. And in the end, you know, if there are this type of cooperations, which I fully support, I think it has to be a win-win situation, uh, you know, for the photographer, you know, for the other institutions or your overseas partner that you want to come into an agreement with. Because we like to think that, you know, it's not going to be a one-off cooperation, and there will be other types of cooperation. For example, we have finished showing uh, Elliot Erwitt's retrospective um, uh, uh, last year, and then the retrospective collection actually can travel. Right. So we are looking at opportunities that you know the 150 images, big images of of Elliot Erwitt can actually go to other countries, other cities, you know, for display, and Elliot yeah. would definitely welcome that. I think we could have a whole other discussion about photographic works and traveling um, at last, last year's um, IIC conference that was actually here in City Hall. They had quite a big panel discussion about loaning works and um, especially things like photography which are so sensitive to climate and travel. Um, that can often happen at quite an expense and I don't mean financial. So um, that, that might be something to explore next year. But I'm just wondering for the, for the artists, you know, when it comes to reference materials, how do you feel about exhibiting that with your work, which kind of helps often to explain a conceptual project to the people who are viewing it? Or do you feel that it's very important to leave it on its own? Do you like to write a lot about the pieces? Mandy, you, we saw a few images that um, were very instrumental in, in helping me understand your process, which I didn't fully understand. For example, even when we were printing the work that you're scattering, um, and you might want to talk a little bit about that, how you're scattering the, the, um, the waste the, that you find and shooting it on those beaches. I mean, that's really fascinating, but I don't think people realize that. They might think you're doing everything in Photoshop and you're not. Uh, yeah, I think that's often the case, and maybe I should describe more about uh, the process, but um, people feel I do a lot in post-production, but in fact, um, once I've made the collections of various different debris, I do categorise them into different sizes um, and put them on a, a large black background with smaller pieces first, um, sort of shoot that layer, uh, medium-sized pieces, um, probably a layer in between the large and the medium. So I have about four different layers which I then sandwich together in Photoshop. Um, and this sort of sandwich is uh, quite random because I want them to um, have the sort of feeling that um, the plastics that exist in the ocean are very random, you know, they're suspended randomly in the ocean. So if I can follow that on through my process in the way I make the prints, um, then that for me is very important. How, how about you? Are, you? are you interested in videos of how he did it? Mm, and things of that nature, for example? Yeah, people tend to 
ask me for videos of a lot of my work, but I usually don't show it. Because um, well, a lot of my recent work is more about audience participation, so kind of what they do within the space after they've seen my picture. So my creative process almost is irrelevant. It's kind of, it's the final product that they see and how they react to it. And as a point, I don't even record what they do. It's kind of what's happening in the museum or in the gallery that's important. And what about, what about in, in explanation on placards and things like that? I mean, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've seen shows of, of artwork in galleries and it's very much, you know, title, date etc. But then you might see, you know, 10 years later, uh, that artist's work at a museum, and the museum curator would really n never be allowed to show that work without a lot of uh, background and explanation. So are we going to learn more about your work in, in time at a big retrospective? <laughs> I mean, how do you rationalize that? Um, well, I, I, th I think what, yeah, okay, so um, <laughs> yes and no, I mean, that's, you're talking very individual pieces, uh, so I guess kind of my strength, even though my work is different from project to project really drastically, it always follows the same theme, and it's always about memories in my, of my family, um, so wherever the work ends up going, wherever it's taken, um, it always fits into a very narrow band of kind of looking at kind of retrospectively where I came from and my family, so it will always fall under the umbrella, so kind of, Individual works really doesn't speak enough volumes. Right. So it's always about the collective rather than individual works. Okay. So do a lot of research online before you go to Kurtz next year. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, that's very, very interesting. I'm just changing tacts a little bit. Kyle, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about, since you've had a lot of experience both as an artist showing your work and as a printer and as an educator, um, about... Uh, and I'm sure every uh, you know e e everyone else is welcome to comment um, on top. But in terms of print sizing and additions and how that impacts value or sale price um, and the types of prints, um, without sort of listing them out, what have you found to be some of the sort of current uh, modes of 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 dealing with that in the commercial space? Well, I guess I'm moving on from a more installation aspect of Kurt's work onto the actual idea of the fine art print as the artifact, as the thing that's being purchased or sold. Um, the editioning is an absolutely essential topic and something that is uh, relatively discussed a lot in contemporary fine art photography nowadays. Um, with digital uh, printing, you have the ability for an infinite reproduction, even with s traditional silver printing you had the ability for an infinite reproduction of the amount of images. And so setting uh, a defined edition size um, at a specific size of the print can add that value to the image. And I'm speaking maybe to the general public that aren't aware of this very um, um, idea that's been discussed quite a bit. Um, but from my standpoint, uh, what I've started to notice is that artists and myself included in this, uh, by limiting the edition size, it, it, it creates a kind of prestige to the image and it also adds value to the image. Um, we're not quite like Kodelko who doesn't print anymore. So the artists that are out nowadays, the images could potentially be printed more. I mean, if we look at uh, Eggleston's reproductions of his C prints that are now digital, prints and yeah. the whole fiasco that happened around that, you have to kind of look at the integrity of the artist and it's important that the artist is making a promise as they make this print um, in the different sizes and the additions that they do. So keeping a limited edition size is something that's essential. Now, one of the things that we did in, in Steve McCurry's studio is that we would actually um, divide those editions down by the size of the print or the type of paper that the print is printed on, or the way that the print is going to be displayed. And we're talking all the way down to the commercialization of a poster print, which is something you may hang on your wall that has, you know, the descriptor underneath and then the National Geographic tag on it. Or it may be something of a fine art caliber, caliber collectible print, and we're talking about something that's printed on an archival paper in an archival process. Um, and then there's the museum gallery prints, which at that time were the Cibachrome prints, was what they wanted to see, the beautiful, saturated, glitzy images. So there's, there are multiple different variations of a print that could be represented, but it's important that the artist is committing to a very specific edition size within that print so that the value can be um, maintained 
and collect it. And so you're getting either one of the print or the absolute last in the edition may have more value. And so it's important that that sort of maintains throughout history. Yeah. Um, I know, I know at, at Weta Hall, um, when we work with artists who are um, up and coming, but who have the mindset for quality and, and wanting um, things done a certain way, they are often asking about print sizes and edition sizes. And, you know, typically for me, because I see a lot of work on multiple levels, you know, I can just convey what, what I have seen out there in the world. Mimi, to what degree are you getting involved? Because you work with and help a lot of emerging artists as they're moving forward. Do you utilize small editions as a way to help craft exclusivity? Or I don't mean to sound that divisive, but do you know what I mean? Yeah. How, how is that handled? I do generally encourage the artists to keep the edition size as small as possible and uh, the types of dimension as little as possible because, well, but there is a general trend of um, printing, getting the prints larger and larger. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess it has to, um, this phenomenon is due to the merge of commercial, uh, con contemporary art and photography. But in terms of addition size, yeah, I do encourage them to, to keep the size for commercial value as well as it is just. It also reflects how they see their artwork and how they how they want to present the artwork to the public. If they know, um, you know, what is the best size for this particular piece of work, they don't have to make two or three more sizes. Right. And um, uh, if you have only one size of this work, I think addition, you know, eight or ten is okay. But if you have three different sizes, even five different sizes, then you know, keep it as small as possible. Yeah. It's it's interesting because Douglas, I think you'll you'll probably have seen um, a couple of things. I mean, one is um, in a lot of the vintage prints. Of course, artists were often either not numbering prints at all, not additioning prints for sure, um, and perhaps just signing them. But you know, often working in an ascending order of numbering, which was sort of the trend up until around the late '60s, early '70s. So. So how do you feel um, when you're looking at work that you'd like to acquire and you see people, for example, William Klein now comes out with these enormous um, contemporary prints or the estate of Imogen Cunningham doing contemporary prints of her work. I mean, serious collectors who, uh, you know, they're not interested in those contemporary prints, but they are a source of income for that estate or for that artist. So how does one rationalize that? Um, do you just simply say, I only want the one that was printed with the artist and their vision? Or do, do you think those have no value? What do you feel about that? I think it really depends on the type of prints uh, you know, we encounter. I mean, with some very special, some very rare vintage prints, I mean, basically, it's not a matter of choice that uh, you have three or four in front of you, or you know three or four sources, uh, you know, that offer a similar print. I mean, sometimes you get an offer of a very rare uh, Cartier-Bresson print, uh, maybe uh, you know from the fifties, printed vintage prints, a beautiful silver print, and and you just have to decide, you know, whether or not um, you know that is something um, in accordance with your collection uh, strategy and or policy or you know of F11, you know, whether this is something that you want to invest into. So I think when it comes to vintage print, it, it really um, uh, depends. I mean, you you need to have plan. You cannot. You know, from a collector's point of view, you cannot collect everything. Of course, you know you can. I mean, if you if you wish. But, but uh, you know, I've, I'm talking about you know from the point of view of uh, of uh, of uh, 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 um, you know if you if you if you want to focus on a particular area, you want to be a specialist in a certain areas. I mean, there's so many out there, and every auction, every two months, you get an auction catalog, and uh, of course, some people can buy everything in it. But uh, I prefer. I think we are buying less and less, and in, in terms of, but we're going after quality. And and so when it comes to prints, you know, of course, uh, 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 sometimes I may be um, wrong, but you know, some vintage prints, um, definitely, I, I see the value. Uh, why 
idea is so much more expensive maybe uh, versus a contemporary print. Um, and sometimes you know that for certain photographers, um, they got involved um, you know, in the printing uh, during their early days. And then um, a lot of these prints, you know, the vintage prints, you know, at the time, they were printed not so much for exhibitions. So a lot of vintage prints that you see, they're small ones. I mean, they may be printed, you know, for a particular purpose, like the press, maybe, you know, for a particular magazine, right. uh, an article. So they're usually small ones. But uh, a lot of times, you know, because they limited their, their numbers so that, uh, for example, for the Magnum prints, you know, they would put their prints with Magnum. And then well, if a magazine or a newspaper wants their print, uh, you know, for for publication, they will write and, and they will send it to them by mail and they will return it. So these type of prints, you know, a lot of them, uh, they're rare because, you know, the photographer would have to approve them personally because they only want their best prints to go out uh, for, for publication. But at the same time, uh, it has a lot of historical value, especially a lot of these vintage prints, when you turn uh, to the back of it, I mean, there's all the history about, you know, where this print has gone to. And yeah. uh, and uh, a lot of them, I mean, uh, uh, I, I think they're very, very special in a sense that, you know, some of the prints, even the photographers themselves or their estate, do not have any more. So uh, nowadays, it's not a matter of you go to a particular photographer or their estate and say that, you know, can I have five of your vintage prints on this and that. Chances are they may not have them. Sure. Because a lot of times, you know, when they printed those, they were not printed f with a commercial intention in mind. And then, you know, those were sold maybe in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and now even the photographers do not have them. And these prints, I would say that, you know, there is definitely a big collector's market um, uh, collecting them. And then I think nowadays um, everyone would like to get hold of the best ones available. But, you know, what constitutes the best ones, uh, you know, again, as I said, you know, they don't appear all at the same time. So, you know, sometimes you buy one and then you get rid of an older one which may not be in the best, you know, best condition. So, you know, collecting is, is fun, but at the same time, I want to, you know, emphasize again that you need a strategy and you need a focus, you know, as to you know, what you want to collect. Kurt, I mean, you work with your printers. Um, you know, we, we're, we've worked together, um, and you work with printers in the UK as well. And the way that you work with them is very one-on-one, -on -one, even though the process by which the printing is done is not necessarily um, a darkroom process. It may be a chemical process, but it's still... <coughs> Uh, not um, as sort of handcrafted as dodging and burning, yet it still takes a lot of artistry. I know that when you're working with CK, our printer, I mean, it, it's quite a laborious process because that's our approach. Um, and we work with inkjet printing the way that people used to work in a dark room. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that that adds a lot more value to your prints versus someone who uploads it to a website and and or just hands the file off to a printer because i would say that you know i, I don't know the value the word's probably wrong but what i probably say is the i'm probably getting the message across better than the people who don't work with the printer because yeah. half well more than half the creative process is in the post-production after you press the button so thank you for if, saying <laughs> True. So if you don't get involved, then you're only being you only involved in half the process. Um, so yeah, I don't know about whether it adds the value, but right. they're not in control of the other half of the production. It's it's interesting because I wonder if um, you know in twenty, thirty, forty years from now, people will be looking back at the prints that were made um, digitally. Uh, and saying the same thing about those that were made sort of by just sort of sending a file off versus working with a printer very personally. Mandy, how have you found uh, printing your work? I mean, it, have you had different experiences? Um, I have, yes. Um, some bad, um, you know, uh, especially sending sort of work abroad. Um, very, very difficult, you know, liaising with different printers in different countries. I've had some sort of disasters where they've sent um, <coughs> sort of um, examples to me and they've just been totally off the mark. So now I always send um, test strips to the printer um, just to make sure that they can match and we can discuss. We have a base point to discuss from that because it's 
very important that my work um, is printed of very good quality um, because the whole aim of my work is to sort of show the objects that are depicted in the print, um, sort of to raise awareness of what's out there. So uh, it's very, very important, yeah. Kyle, you've, you've had a multitude of experiences um, and of course you, you print all of your own work? Well, there's only been one instance and this is a, a, an admission, I guess, that I've ever let anybody print my own work and it's, and it's only because he's a very good friend of mine and I've worked with him before in the past. Elliot, actually, Scott knows Elliot quite well. Um, he works at the Will College of William and Mary and was recently having an exhibition and really wanted a piece of mind to be present in it, so I, I said yes. Um, and in that circumstance, I, I maybe was a little bit over, over the top, but I even sent him my own uh, pro custom made paper profile and the paper type he had to print on and then the printer types that he had, um, it was made directly for it. Sure. But I guess what it really speaks to is that it, it is important, as Kurt is mentioning, that, that you're com completely involved in the process um, from start to finish. Otherwise, you lose something there. The artist steps away or steps aside, and then it's not the same caliber of the work. It's not yeah. the same uh, representation. Do you think that, I mean, Douglas, you're saying that you know it's interesting because you're very aware, for example, with vintage prints, which which works um, an artist has sort of been involved with with the what the printing uh, what the print looks like and, and the actual print itself um, even if they are not printing the work personally so you know but it sounds like you don't see contemporary printed work being sort of handled or that that artistry being conveyed would you agree with that no, I'll put it well. No, I, I think I think um, uh, just now when uh, uh, you know Carl mentioned um, that you know he wanted to be um, hundred percent you know involved in in the printing, you know I, I'm very very glad to hear that uh, because I, I think you know photographers they they should be in charge you know of the process yes. you know from from first start to finish, but at the same time I think you know uh, for example uh, the job of you know Mimi and myself in you know, organizing these exhibitions is that we want to ensure that if we received such a wonderful print. Uh, you know, from the photographer and, you know, the labor, the hard labor of, of the printer and all of that. You know, we want to ensure that we do justice with the prints. And, and that's why I think, you know, at galleries, as in museums, you know, when we install them, uh, you know, when we put the proper lighting and all of that, I mean, we, we and if we frame them, I mean, we, we have to, at the same time, you know, do a, an excellent job. Otherwise, you know, all the hard work that goes in, in the printing, I mean, you will not see them, or, or you will think that oh, you know, all the reflection and all, you know, the, the angle of the light, the, the 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 type of lighting and everything is not done properly. So um, I just want to respond by saying that I, I think you know we we need to you know work together very very closely to ensure that you know the whole process until a visitor uh, you know come to look at an image, you know, every step uh, before you know it's done properly and in detail and in, you know done professionally. Yeah. Mimi, what has been your experience with the Hong Kong viewing public in terms of their appreciation of all this effort? I mean, you know, everyone um, involved in the process clearly is, is taking a lot of time. Um, what have you found the response has been and, and how do you sort of gauge um, their responses? I think people we receive in the gallery are generally um, a more focused public, especially since we moved from um, Soho back to Wong Chuk Hang, uh, an industrial area. So people, uh, it's a very focused crowd, um, collectors, um, art professionals, um, curators, uh, even students, but art students, not just, um, we don't get many tourists. But I do encounter questions like at art fair, especially where you receive lots of public um, day to day, um, questions like, well, oh, whether this is, how much is this poster? Um, uh, are they for sale? Um, yeah, questions like this. But I have to say the, appreciate, the level of appreciation level, um, appreciation of photography in Hong Kong has increased massively. We started five years ago and I see a huge change um, in that respect in, in the mere five years. Would, would I mean, anyone's uh, free to answer this, but would you agree that um, the ability of the general public who mo have a telephone with a camera, but so many people who also are out taking photographs as enthusiasts, 
Would you agree that that's actually added um, to the interest and popularity of collecting photography because people feel closer to the medium? Or at least that's the sort of positive way that I like to look at it. I don't know if you'd agree or disagree, but I think that you know, some people say everyone's a photographer now. I, I don't think that's true. I think there's ve a very clear distinction between artists who work in photography or utilize or employ photography and um, people who are taking pictures for themselves. But the fact that they are so keen on photography really helps uh, the industry. I don't know if, if anyone agrees or disagrees. Please. I mean, I'm relatively new, I guess, to the Hong Kong photography scene, having only been here for maybe a year and a half, a little bit more. But I, I think I can speak to to the excitement that you're talking about. Um, there, the, the consumer photographer culture here is rampant. There are a lot of people out there loving their gear, loving to take pictures, loving to take it out to whatever scene or rent a model to come photograph them in the streets. Or it, it Very interesting sort of setup that's happening. And I, I don't know if I can necessarily speak to that influencing a contemporary photography, fine art photography culture, but I do think it, 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 it furthers an appreciation for photography to an extent. However, there, I think, lacks a certain type of education, and that that's will take time and as Mimi has mentioned over the past five years since Blind Spot opened there has been an evolution and I think with the onset of Art Central and Art Basel and and the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association and these movements to educate the public about fine art and specifically fine art photography I think that eventually this visual language people will start to understand it better and they'll uh, better understand the value of photography in comparison to the New York market or even the Paris market or, or in, even in Tokyo I think that that Hong Kong is actually a little bit behind when it comes to the contemporary photography market and I think that that they're growing and it's growing with full steam ahead which is actually a very exciting time to be part of it right now I don't know if I'm accurate maybe some people who've been here longer can speak to that how how, how do you feel Mandy when you are someone who's very dedicated to a certain issue and you're using your artistic practice to convey your sentiment about that. Do you think that people appreciate, and have you, when you've been around the show in Hong Kong specifically, how do you feel that people have reacted um, to your work when it's in an issue-based setting versus when it's in a contemporary art setting that may not be necessarily related to, to a waste theme, for example? Yeah. Um. Both, both um, situations um, have been well appreciated. Um, I, I'm always sort of concerned of having my work, well, not concerned, um, I'm obviously very appreciative of having it in both settings, but in a gallery situation, you know, it may miss a lot of people that would normally, say for example, if it was exhibited outside in a public area, um, those sort of people would interact with it in a way where they may not necessarily visit a gallery. You know, a lot of people are put off by visiting a gallery situation. So, um, you know, I think both ways um, get the response that I'm after. But, they, you know, one, one is obviously in a contemporary setting and one is more um, interacting with the public. Kurt, could you, could you actually, uh, and, and then I think we'll open up to the Q&A, but I'd like to get your take because I think with the crafted nature of the artwork that you're showing and, um, you know, people really need to come and see it in order to fully appreciate the work. Sure. So how do you find that, uh, that people are receiving it when they're looking at it online um, or they're coming into a gallery? Well, I think a lot of my work, yeah, I mean, it's especially the newer work, it, it is installation based and kind of audience participation. So if they do look online on a website, it's they're just looking at the idea rather than the work itself. Right. Um, so it is important to, to, for people to come into the gallery um, or galleries. Um, and kind of to answer kind of back your first yeah. question, yeah. I think, whether kind of the, the boom of photography, the consumers' photography helps. Um, I think it, get, it helps to get them into the gallery but it doesn't help them understand what's on the wall, um, which is, I guess, is Mimi's and Douglas' job to put on work that's kind of gaps to, and again, kind of, I think it's dangerous also to kind of say that Art Basel and Art Central would help the art scene, because they are, 
they come with price tags. <laughs> um, so it needs a kind of venues that shows work that's bridge between the consumer's world and the, the top end commercial world, which is kind of photographic art in the middle that needs to be shown more. Yeah, it's true. Well, I'd like to open it up to Q&A before I thank the panelists, because I think that's an extension of our conversation. Are there any questions? Um, I'd like to ask the panel, um, to what extent do social media platforms are relied upon in selling photography nowadays? I've never sold one single work through the social media platform. <laughs> I, yeah, sales maybe is an, is, a, is an odd question, but I think from, from a promotional standpoint, from an artist, I think it's important that we're integrating our work into a social media platform to an extent just to raise awareness or to maintain uh, visibility. Um, Oftentimes, that's really important. I guess that eventually leads to a sale, perhaps? I think, I think that's really the question, is more along the lines of what role does social media play in helping bring people to seeing the work and then, and then leading to placement of the work or sales of the work or an understanding? I, I, I guess for me, it's, it, I, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big social media person, but I do use it to kind of drop hints that I'm working on my next project because it quite often it takes me two to three years before I launch an entire new project. So it kind of is the little clues that I'm actually working on something. That's what I use it for. <laughs> I'm personally quite against all these online platforms, online art fairs or online sales room. I, I think it's important to stress for Dovi, the stress of physicality of it. It's not just an image, it's not just a print, it's, it's a work. Therefore, I'm against buying or selling <laughs> online. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Scott, um, Scott Dietrich, who's a Hi, professor of photography at Hi. SCAD. Um, but just to, just to go back a little bit with Mimi, um, but you do have an interactive feature on your website for your gallery where we can walk around a virtual Especially exhibition. Tomorrow, yeah, which I actually use in my classroom when I talk about shows, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. So I think it does play a... a it, it's not, a, like Kyle said, I don't think it's a sales role. Like you're not there with a a price list and, a, and buying from that. But I do think it, in terms of exposure, in terms of education, in terms of um, bringing people into the gallery that might not have that experience or allowing, you know, that virtual understanding and, and platform, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty important and plays a, it can play a larger role. I think it's great. Is is uh, social social media is a great aid to induce interest to bring help people come to the gallery to see the exhibition and not to be scared. But um, yeah. do you think we, that we, we um, um, I think we managed to sell a few books on the, through social media, <laughs> but not prints. Uh, well, I think uh, it, uh, social media is effective in a way that um, I think it's, it's a great communication uh, platform, especially um, you know, if you want to go international, um, um, that you need to let people outside of Hong Kong, you know, know what you are and, you know, uh, and what you're showing and all of that. Uh, so nowadays, you know, when our visitors come, we do ask them, you know, where um, you learn about us and all of that. And, and, you know, quite a few of them told us that, you know, it's via the net, it's via social yeah. media. So I think in that sense, it's important to, to first bring people to you and then sales and everything well, that, that may follow. I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding, and, and maybe it actually applies to certain organizations, that there's sort of an elitist feeling about um, not participating in social media. We, we don't do you know, these things because we are above that. But I, I in fact, think that um, it's a very good point that Mimi has made, which is the fact that um, you know, it's... Photography is misunderstood as something that's easily reproduced because you can print another, could make another. So by going too mass uh, with your approach, it almost kind of trivializes the medium and it doesn't show the importance of the actual print, the actual piece of artwork that someone is buying. So um, 
but I do think sometimes that that many of us are are thought of as being uh, part of an elitism, which I don't think is is anyone's intention because people are just trying to create um, what and and do what they're doing. How about another question? I think we have a time for a few more questions. This one is uh, an artist question. Um, in terms of printmaking, um, do, if you were to focus in on just one step in your post-production, which would it be that's the most important for creating a successful print? Wow. <laughs> that's a lot of <laughs> you can take a minute I'll, if you like. I'll, I mean, I'll work from from a very specific standpoint. As a as a photographer and artist, I, I I use a large format camera and I shoot eight by ten and scan my film um, to process. And from that standpoint, there are two times that I'm photographing. I'm photographing once when I use the camera to make the image, and then photographing again when I scan the image to then render it in a post production format in Photoshop, for instance for output. So f from my standpoint, the scan is actually absolutely essential um, because it's creating a digital negative of the already existent negative. And so there needs to be this open existence so that I can then work into the image and create the print. Similar to you know Adam's prints um, where he has multiple different versions from the start, it's very open and clean. And then from the finish point, it's extremely manipulated and pushed you know, to the beauty that it is. Um, so I would I would argue to say from someone who's working in a hybrid format that the scan is actually as essential as actually pressing the shutter. Can I can I ask you a question? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Because um, because I, I also shoot on large format negatives and okay. traditionally it's always been scanned on drum scans. Yeah. And in UK now certainly they stopped making parts with the drum scans. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you um, and I have a lot. In so common. there's like a fine <laughs> gap now. They they're talking about in the next stage that they're actually to scan a negative, they're going to use a high-end digital bag to take a photograph of it. Yeah, that's a very interesting and what is the heading point? conceptual. <laughs> yeah, why would you Why would you? Why don't I just use that? a high-end bag yeah. to start off with? Well, so. from, from my standpoint, the reason I don't is because, one, I can't afford it. I don't have a high-end no, digital sure. bag. Um, but from another standpoint, uh, it, it, I use film specifically because it has just a, a tonal value that's very different than, right, yeah. than if you were to shoot with a, a digital camera. I mean, eventually, that'll be far surpassed. But right now, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be sponsored by Kodak, and so they send me the film. So it's much cheaper for me to shoot right. with that than to work with, a, a I don't know, an IQ60 back. Sure, yeah, yeah. And to be honest, it doesn't have the same control over the depth of field. Also, using no, the large yeah. format view camera, you know, sure, you have a yeah. much more control yeah. in the long run. No, because I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, no, it's because my, for my new project, I'm actually choosing to go darkroom prints because yeah. I don't want to be have a picture of it taken off a digital bag and then print it again. So are you going to contact print? Sorry, we're getting nerdy here. Uh, no, no it's, uh, no, it's actually a darkroom print. Like, oh. It'll be projected. But, okay. Um, right. <laughs> let's, let's, um, and let's go back to the question. Sorry. So, uh, well, put very simply for me, it's to go from a digital file to a finished high quality print uh, and that journey in between um, without... Um, sort of adding any saturations and unnecessary um, effects that take my work away from exactly how I find the objects on the beach. I want them to be represented exactly how I find them and to get those kind of colours, uh, lighting, midterms, etc. everything um, is a very difficult process and yeah, very simply is just to, from the computer screen to the print. Uh, I guess for me it was finding my printer, <laughs> uh, someone who knows a lot about papers and ink and, and darkroom techniques so he can recommend things to me that I can see and choose. So I guess that was the most important thing because I think for each project the output is different so the important parts changes but I can always ask Mark, reference back, to see what he recommends. Any, any other questions? I don't think so. Cars? Yeah, I'm, I'm just a bit more curious about um, kind of the commercial practice from, from galleries or, or collectors also in regard to, to new media prints, so inkjet, inkjet printing, jiclay printing, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
any particular concerns also in terms of um, the way prints are mounted I mean we've seen we've seen prints here in the exhibition mounted on alu debond and uh, possibly with with perspex covering or or any any kind of other sandwiching sandwiching techniques um, would you go from collector's point of view or gallery point of view just for purely the print without any additional finishing or um, I mean what would be your, your choices there? I think the choice to a large extent li lies with the artist. Um, the artist normally provide a print which has to be archival and uh, we, we, we always mount and frame mount the archival print on my archival materials, if, um, be it foam board or aluminum. Um, and then when it comes to framing, artists these days are becoming increasingly specific with uh, framing. Um, actually, lots of them see, sorry, see the frame as part of the work. Um, so yeah, uh, we as a gallery, to run a business, we try to be cost efficient. So we try we always tend to get the most, um, if, you know, the most economical way to frame the amount of the work without compromising its presentation, of course. But then uh, there are some cases if an artist is very particular about the framing and mounting, he or she uh, would rather take full control of it, or we try to try as much as possible to facilitate it. Yeah. But I, I personally, I don't have a strong pr preference. Um, in terms of the type of paper, and as long as it's archival. Yeah. Um, I, I think it depends on the photographers. Um, uh, I, I'm just trying to think, you know, the last few years, you know, uh, the, 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 the collections or the prints that we, we have brought into the archive of F11. Um, you know, we have got um, some, you know, very limited editions uh, works, you know, from, um, for example, uh, um, Juice Perez um, on Telex Iran, uh, very important uh, works that he did in Iran in 1979. Um, he, he made uh, just um, five sets, okay, and everything came already, you know, s uh, frame set, you know, in uh, um, uh, 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 there's, there's really nothing that you can do. I mean, if you want to acquire this collection, I mean, you, you have to um, uh, acquire the whole thing uh, that comes with crates, and then um, and then you know they even give you a specification as to you know how he would like these prints to be shown. Okay, so but normally, I mean, I, that that would be you know one exception, but but normally the other end would be you know, photographer just you know. Uh, some of them, uh, uh, I think they took more time in terms of um, uh, how they present their prints to you or they ship everything to you. But at the same time, you have the other extreme would be one that, you know, just roll the film into a tube and then mail it to you. So, you know, you, you get everything. It really depends on, on, um, on uh, the photographers. You know, some of the photographers, I think they are very much focused on, on, on their works. But, you know, when it comes to how they keep the prints and some of the vintage prints, they probably store away for like 30 years and they take it out and then they don't want to keep their vintage prints. And then if you agree to buy something from them, they would just send it to you and pack in a, I would, I would not say a very professional way, but, <laughs> but you know, happy to have them, but yeah. uh, but again, I want to stress the point, and and that is really uh, you, you see everything. I mean, the the, the practice is, is is very very varied, actually. Yeah. I I don't know. Um, well, I think maybe this is what uh, you're saying as well. But I I would th I would say that this is really a mindset of of individuals, and I was discussing this I think uh, with Kyle the other day that for us we see artists of every type. Uh, shooting every kind of work um, and at every stage in their career and what's interesting is uh, because for example you know our printing is very one-on-one -on -one and um, not inexpensive um, you know it's a mindset of people who are interested in quality and who are interested in materials and it's really not um, to do much at all with sort of how well they're known or how much they sell for. And it's just fascinating because you will also, I mean, I've also had the opportunity to study and look very closely and learn about a lot of printing and print types and, and 
and work with artist prints that I'm not in any way involved in. And I've been surprised at the very low quality and the very um, dodgy type of uh, framing and mounting that has gone on. And I think, you know, it's just quite interesting because it's, it's, not, and it's not something that everyone cares about. And it's probably very difficult as a museum curator and a gallery owner uh, to kind of have to take on and take care of things that haven't necessarily been treated properly. Absolutely. I've turned back, unlike a vintage print, a, a con I think a contemporary photography print um, has to be flawless in its condition. I've turned back so many prints to printers and artists because of the tiniest dent or scratch. And I think uh, um, in a contemporary art world, contemporary photography world, a uh, dented print is considered almost commercially valueless. I, I wholly agree. Um, I'd just like to give um, um, each of the panelists an opportunity to just tell you about what, uh, what they have coming up, whether it's their own work or a show that they have on, just uh, so that we can continue to expand our interaction with, um, with what's going on uh, with these uh, panelists and with photography. And I'd personally just like to say thank you so much to everyone who's come on your Saturday. And there is another talk uh, going on after this, which I encourage you to stay for. Um, and thank you so much to Wing Foundation for sponsoring uh, these social, socially minded, um, issues based uh, artistic awards, which uh, all of which the finalists work is so beautiful and poignant and different on these topics. Um, people like Stanley Wong, who's here, who's come to the talk, thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure for me to work with everyone on the panel and for us to print the work of all the artists. We've really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for taking time. Kurt, Mandy, Douglas, Mimi, Kyle, thank you. And, and I, I encourage them to, to brag a little bit here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, I'm in the middle of creating my new work, which is set to debut in Amsterdam in September. Uh, but kind of the work that's closest to my heart, which is a book about my family, uh, that exhibi the exhibition will continue to tour and is going to San Francisco and Bradford next year. Okay, uh, well, I'm continuing my work with marine plastic debris um, and for the seeable future. Um, a project I'm working on at the moment is I'm liaising with a scientist in the UK who's discovered in laboratory conditions that plankton have started to eat microplastic particles. So this is something that I'm going to develop in my next project. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, at Ave 11, uh, we are now showing uh, Robert Kepper's uh, work on China in 1938. And, uh, and at the same time, we are also showing um, a, a Leica camera uh, exhibition. Uh, and these two exhibitions will actually end in about a week's time. And then you know, we'll be getting ready uh, to put up uh, Bruno Barbie's um, uh, China since 1973, uh, which will open on the 28th of May. At the same time, on the camera side, uh, we will be doing an exhibition on instant cameras. So uh, uh, it will be a very interesting uh, exhibition. Uh, so, uh, and end of the year, we are hoping to show um, some works of Hong Kong, uh, taken by another magnum photographer, um, a Swiss magnum photographer, Werner Bischoff. Uh, he was in Hong Kong in 1952, and he took some really gorgeous uh, images of, of, of Hong Kong. And uh, for the Bruno Barbie exhibition, uh, Bruno and his wife uh, will be in, in, uh, in Hong Kong to talk about the works, and also sign his new book and then uh, in October we hope to um, um, bring in uh, Werner Bischoff's son Marco Bischoff uh, you know to uh, to uh, to to come to the opening and also uh, lead a few workshops you know on Werner Bischoff's works thank you um, at the gallery at the moment we are still uh, showing 
Exhibition Museum of the Lost, featuring collaborative works of Hong Kong artist Leung Chi Wo, Warren, and Sarah Wong. Um, their first collaboration was exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2001. And following that, we'll be um, mounting a solo exhibition for a mainland Chinese artist called Zhang Xiao. He's most known for his uh, epic series, Coastline, um, featuring the, the, the entire 18,000 kilometer of coastline in China. Um, yeah. I guess I get to go last here. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, a new body of work entitled Forever Wild. It's based on the Adirondack Park in northern New York. It's a 6.1 million acre park that 200,000 people live within. But it's really um, a conceptual photo documentary that reflects on the evolution of an American landscape. And I don't mean to bore you by that, but it's going to be creating a, um, a personal novel or of sorts, a book, in, a book project in the long run. And I'm hoping that that will come to a close within the end of the year and that um, it'll go to publication. Um, and since I'm relatively new here in Hong Kong, if you want to know more about me, you can go social media and find out more about me. If you Google my name, Kyle Ford, or if you follow me, um, I believe I have an Instagram account and the website and all that stuff. And, uh, and since I'm relatively new here in Hong Kong, I'm currently seeking representation at galleries here. <laughs>